really the, the whole sort of idea with this is to just get a real behind the scenes into what it's like as a publisher, a designer, a bookshop owner, ex bookshop ex. owner, <laughs> <laughs> you know, distributor. I just really want to get an insight from you. Um, so thanks, Tom, for coming and doing this. Thanks for having me. Um, Tom from Guest Editions. Um, we're, first of all, I guess it would just be nice if you could just give us a little bit of background about how you sort of started in the photo book world. Um, obviously, you have your design studio, Studio Thomas, which you do with uh, Tom Austin as well. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of how did the design stuff come first and then the photo books? How did it all sort of blend together, basically? Yeah, I guess it was sort of a natural progression of what I was doing in the studio. Um, because we did a lot of stuff in the like world of photography in a design sense uh, in the studio. Um, we've always worked with a lot of, I guess, like commercially kind of photo agencies, um, but also with kind of organizations, institutions, Martin Parr Foundation. Okay. Um, and friends. You were doing stuff, you do that now, but the photo stuff hadn't sort of come up before then yeah well that was more in kind of the world of, of branding right and like creating de like design identities um and websites like photo agency websites okay um but i guess a lot of that came from a sort of a passion for photography um i mean i studied photography and went kind of to art foundation with the intention of following that but then i i didn't really know what graphic design was at that point and then I think I thought it would be a more commercially viable like route to go, <laughs> route to go down, <laughs> um, and did the sort of taster part of the course, and then just really loved it. And I, I think I loved the opportunity to like use design as a way of working with lots of different kind of mediums, and, okay. and one of those being photography, which obviously could be like my own, it could be other people's, mm -hmm. um, and design was kind of a framework for being able to like explore lots of things visually um but anyway yeah so when as part of studio thomas we designed books for other people um friends that were kind of making books at the time but then other publishers uh like Ho hoxton mini press who designed like a small series for them um and other things that were more kind of yeah brand led or or websites for for photographers or artists or institutions and then so I guess sort of was a natural progression on that I think and then I made a book with Laura as I like as our first book okay Laura um, McCluskey Laura McCluskey yeah and I think that was that sort of needed a home um so we were able to kind of put it out and then that's where kind of guest was born um, so when did guest start that was in 2019 okay yeah so five years ago yeah. and the first thing you put out was Laura's was blue above yeah um and we had yeah an exhibition and, and a first book and then that kind of felt like a good opportunity to sort of start something more publishing led okay um and it we, we had to be able to kind of sell it and give it a, a place and a home and like I guess that then <sighs> took us almost into lockdown and I think probably it was the fact that COVID hit that there was much more time to sort of think about that as a as a place to sort of spend time kind of creatively have like an output that wasn't dependent on clients and mm. other people's sort of briefs basically um, and you could kind of throw ourselves into that um, without waiting on someone else. Yeah. Um, I think you guys were always like, well, I remember well, you guys did the Sabutio yeah. book, didn't you? I always yeah. thought that was quite play. I think when I first saw that, I really loved the design aspect of that and how sort of playful nice. it was. Yeah. And um, I guess just let people know a little bit about that. So that was, uh, what was the project with that one? So Tom uh, Groves shot uh, professional Sabutio players who like Sabutio players that were playing on like an international level. Okay. Um, and these tournaments kind of happen all around the world in kind of 
sometimes in actual football stadiums, but in the kind of internal rooms of the stadiums. Right. Um, sometimes they happen in like sports halls, in like train stations, in wherever. But Tom basically started traveling around, going to these uh, Sabutio tournaments. Um, and I think what struck me was like just the level of like passion and seriousness that like goes in like to playing that game. Mm. And I think when you talk about it like, oh yeah, Sabutio, like, I don't know. If you're of our age, you would remember playing it as a kid. Yeah. In a bedroom. With yeah, we, we had it on like the dining room table. Yeah. It was kind of old anyway, so it's kind of rickety and you'd have like the felt cloth yeah. that you'd and like And it gets wrinkled down. up yeah, and yeah, you're trying yeah, to yeah, like yeah. pull it out so you can flick the players without them like wobbling off. <laughs> but these guys, are like they go in, it's, yeah. it's not like, it's not just like a silly bedroom game. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like serious, it's 100%. Um, but that we, it was so much to sort of, just in like visually there's so much to go off and I think at the time as a designer that was a really fun project to work on because we had the material of the felt so we like bound mm. the cover in um that like flock uh material yeah and then screen printed like a screen of like white dots onto it um inside we had all the like quotes from the players we could do a flash um, on the screen of uh, I'll find it yeah. online so people would know 100% what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I just always thought that was like, I just, I think that real great combination between great graphic design, photography, and also making something feel playful. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the project, and that kind of project is quite a playful project, isn't it? In a sense, it's yeah. not particularly. Exactly, yeah. Like the, the seriousness of the, people taking the game but really it's kind of a it's not particularly the most serious no, subject no. in a sense so it's and graphically i mean really you're good. talking about like a 90s box game so yeah. like there's just so much material history and material yeah, yeah. that you can that you can use and i think that's what i like about the kind of intersection of photography and design is that you can use design as a way of adding something contributing to like the, the sort of the context of those images right um and like making it something that it couldn't have been in in isolation or mm. as just a series of images yeah, yeah, yeah um and the other one we worked on at the time was defective carrots which was like <laughs> these sort of mug shots of carrots that weren't deemed suitable to end up on shop Oh, okay, shelves. yeah, yeah, so that was like weird <laughs> deformed fruit. Basically. Yeah, yeah, but they were <laughs> oh, these really nice studio vegetables. portraits almost. Okay. Um, <laughs> shot on like against white backgrounds, um, but we just made that at kind of, you were seeing them at, at to scale kind mm. of size. Um, and do you, has that playfulness, playfulness, I guess, led into Guest? I guess I, guess I kind of think of Guest as quite traditional, in a sense, I mean, there's playfulness like in design aspects, but with the photographers that you work with, mm. it's very kind of. I think the work's quite, quite always quite big on the page. Mm. It's quite has like a nice sort of everything has quite a nice flow, but there's not particularly, maybe, and the work is maybe a bit more serious than that. Do you think that's sort of led yeah, into it? Yeah, because or? I think maybe the when. When we started and those projects we were working on, I guess in nature were less sort of developed, or um, the, the the projects that we're now working on, I think, have matured, and my approach to the design maybe has matured mm, slightly. Yeah. What I'm looking for in a project might have become more complex or less immediate, and I think, obviously, your approach to the to the design needs to sort of adapt um, with that. I mean... Yeah, and support the work. And you know, yeah, experience. you can't, I think whilst I've, uh, yeah, like I was saying is that the potential of like good design is that you can, you can amplify something or you can add something to work, but you, you would never want it to kind of steal attention or take over, mm. especially when it becomes, you know, a more, I don't know, developed or, complex body of work you need to be quite sensitive in like how you're designing mm. around that um and so those moments of play I think are still there it's just they might have become more 
subtle. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, even like on this this book, the just finding something graphically to to sort of reflect the the title or the mm. um, the work itself. Yeah. So let's go into. So how many sort of titles has guest released so far? Is it? People always ask that and I've never counted it. <laughs> no. It's probably <laughs> 10, is there? Okay. Yes. Yeah, you think about 10? Yeah. And so this book here, which is uh, Laura Panic, I'm going to try and read this. Yeah. Use Age Without Life Death. <laughs> Fucked it. I Fucked it. <laughs> you know what the book's called, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't actually seen this book yet. Have you not? No. Oh, okay. I haven't seen it. I, I'm coming to this completely blank with Laura's book. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I've failed as a graphic designer. But no, it's youth without age, life without death. Ah, but the that's me being quite dyslexic though, and sort of not. That's fine. But I mean, I think also it's this sort of it's a I don't know it's a long title, and I think the fun of it is that it's hard to get right. Mm. Um, and it's not it's not kind a kind of easy series or subject. It is kind of it's pretty complex and i think the fact that it can distort slightly in the title is quite a nice thing okay so let's again let's start off i guess with going into this book like what was your sort of what's the the idea for like the color how does everything sort of um link with this the image that we have on the front what was your sort of thoughts on going into the when you're when you're designing a book is the cover completely becoming is the very last thing is Laura No, I'm always the like is I'm probably imagine the cover the first conversation I've had with an artist. Okay, right. Um and then the rest of it's just like <laughs> the rest you just gotta get done later. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's a good way to go. I lo- I love designing covers and I always feel like I mean you have some I guess some publishers take a more uh, I don't know, they have a more templated approach um, or the f- covers feel more sort of maybe consistent, but I think I always want the, the design of the cover to sort of create, it sets the tone for the book and it's an opportunity to add something um, to the kind of the world and the identity around that work. Mm. Um, and I mean, with this, we're talking about talking about time um, we're talking about something that's quite sort of hard to grasp. Um, and we're talking about the fact that, I don't know, can time be frozen? Can things stand still? Do we have to age? Do we have to die? Um, and so I wanted to kind of capture some of that in the cover. Okay. Um, the whole the fact that the title has a framework and is a bit missing and it's slightly distorted, I think, mm. um, sits with that. And this became a sort of vignette and a motif that kind of pops up. Um, this is obviously just like a a frame that's kind of stuck, and you've got a few a, a couple of frames or a few frames in this in this negative, and so that became a sort of it sort of sums up the topic in one image for me. It's like that sort of stutter between the progression of time. Um, is that something that Laura would have shown you as an image? Before? Is this was it a mistake, and then you and then you found it later on, or it was amongst like many photos that we looked at. Okay, um, I was I was very involved in the the like edits, and we started with quite a wide edit, so there was a lot of stuff that she was finding at the time sharing with me kind of weighing up whether it sort of felt like it had a part in the book Mm. and I think seeing that um I don't know resonated and then it became sort of this um yeah something you kept coming back to yeah yeah exactly um and it's it's in the book as a sort of a moment that sort of breaks things up so give us a little bit of background about this book and sort of how Laura approached you or did you approach Laura? I approached her actually um, because I'd seen her work and just I was fascinated by it because I think in terms of the images that she makes they feel like they hold so much magic and mystery Um, and that was the kind of book I think I wanted to make um, last year. 
Is this this isn't Laura's first book? It is. It yeah. is, isn't it? Yeah. Because she's done sort of smaller. She did. There was a photo things. prize that had a, had a sort of more of a I don't know catalog. Yeah. Um, but this is the first actual actual book. Right. Um, yeah. So then we, I mean, we just sort of spent a lot of time working on the edit of it, really. Um, in, so, in a room, like going through six by fours. Is that your sort of classical way to sort of not really? But it was. Book? We sort of quickly realised that that was the way that we were going to be able to make progress with with that. I mean, it was it was a kind of a hard task editing down to what kind of appears in the final book, um, and I think. You know, everyone's got different working relationships, but I think we just found that things clicked when we were able to just be in a room together and, and look at things and make decisions. And every time we had one of those meetings, there would be like a notable kind of progression. Right. Um, and then every time there was time away from kind of being able to have those face-to-face -face meetings, we both slightly kind of separated and ended up in on a, like a different page and it, and it, and it kind of lost that, um, momentum. Okay. Um, so we sort of realized it was something that we needed to kind of be together for. Yeah. Yeah. At and, least until we got to the point of having an edit. Yeah. And is that sort of, is that a pretty familiar process with other people that you've published through guests? Is it, it's been, it's been different, but we've tended to be quite involved in, in the editing and sequencing of the, of the work. Um, but people come to you with in like all different sort of stages. Um, okay. I mean, when, when I worked on Padanistan with Tommaso, he'd worked with an editor and he had a final sequence. It was like an ordered edit. It was, it was locked down. Right. The essay had been written. And so really my role was much more as a sort of designer and, and producer for the okay. book. Um, whereas, I guess more commonly people come to you with their images. Yeah, something a bit looser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think as photographers, people don't always have, not everyone is as comfortable editing their own work. And I think they need that kind of outside perspective to be able to sort of make decisions. Mm -hmm. um, you probably do it a lot because you're used to making books and turning things into, uh, yeah. in, into kind of projects. I guess I'm interested, I get, I, I do get, I'm really interested in how different people do the editing process because sometimes I take a weird, I don't know if it's a weird route, but I'll just ask the photographer to send me all the images that they want to go into the book. Yeah. And then I'll just design it and make a dummy. Like, make a dummy. With like, them all. With them all. Yeah. Maybe not with them all, but I'll edit from that. Okay. I'll do the whole layout. Yeah. I do it really quickly, so I'll just be, do it on the screen. I won't print anything out. Yeah. I'll just go completely off instinct. Mm -hmm. And then I'll make a physical dummy to mm -hmm. show them. And I find that as soon as I've sort of taken it off the screen and they're holding something, yeah, yeah. there's a complete shift. Yeah, exactly. And this doesn't obviously happen all the time, but sometimes you can be quite close and obviously then you sort of go in and you start to, it's like writing a first draft or something, isn't mm -hmm. it? which I said before, but it's kind of like, and then you sort of then go in and sort of pick it apart and go, okay, that doesn't work. This does, that doesn't. Yeah. But you have a kind of something that you can keep going back to physically, which I yeah. kind of yeah. I quite enjoy doing it in that way. Yeah. Um, I think for me, there's sort of, there's two steps. I mean, there's like many steps after to kind of fine tune, but I think there's the first wide edit, which sometimes isn't done mm -hmm. and I think that kind of has to happen before you can even get to the stage of printing things out or making dummies and then there's the second one which I think can be done with more sort of reason and logic and like rationale mm. um, but you know sometimes I mean on our Melissa had two three hundred images right and so you need to be like what well, we need to like yeah, yeah, get yeah, these yeah. down a little bit just so just it's not feasible you know um and what do you enjoy that process do you... not the wide one <laughs> no no but like that yeah that's sort of the sort of the idea of 
trying to sort of build build that story is it something yeah do do? yeah but i think that's that's not been a part of my skill set as a designer previously right okay i think kind of laying things out choosing materials designing type Mm. working with image that's all a part of kind of your skill set as a as a designer but i think editing is something that i've really kind of consciously worked on Mm. and developed as as i've kind of um, been a publisher so this is really nice sort of getting into sort of the midway part of the book we've got this trace sort of tracing paper section with illustrations on Mm. what's the sort of what was the story behind this part of the the these were just there's all these kind of like bits of material that Laura had but these are so this whole just in short the the title youth without age and life without death is a is a Romanian folklore okay folk tale sorry um and it's about a prince being handed eternal life by his dad mm-hmm. um so the work kind of uses that as a as a framework the project uses a framework to kind of recreate moments in that tale um so some of these setups directly kind of reference moments in that story okay um but that story was given to to children um the ages are on some of the drawings like yeah. five seven uh, f- uh no 15 years later 15. um <laughs> i was like 15 <laughs> <laughs> <You're right laughs> <I know. laughs> snuck in there mate <laughs> uh, yeah. um to see how they kind of responded to it and just to get something that wasn't necessarily just uh, the product of the image making or the product of the artist's head. Mm. It was sort of wanting to kind of take that into someone else's imagination. Okay. And then obviously like anything that children do is like 10 times more like kind yeah. of interesting and unexpected than yeah, anyone else yeah. does. Um, and that was something that Laura had already sort of collected with it. Would it, was that going to be something that she was going to photograph? Was it always sort of meant to be integrated into the work? It, it, there, it none of those things were were sort of decided. Okay. Um, and so we decided to scan them and use them as these like full bleed kind of textures. Um, in terms of the like construction of the book, because these are the other kind of key part of what there is, is these Polaroids. And these are all shot, but they, they look kind of completely sort of vintage. Um, so L- all, Laura took these ones Laura took but, those, yeah. um, in Romania in the same kind of uh, town um, but it, this sort of needed to have a place in the book so mm. an- another decision was about whether they should kind of pop up amongst the other images like what was the hierarchy what was the relationship t- between those that feels so kind of of their own um, style yeah and so, I mean, part of the, the the story is about this kind of treasure chest being found in this kind of moment of eternal time. So we wanted to sandwich this in a sort of um, protected area, like you're discovering that chest almost. Okay. So you have the kind of the main sequence of images. Um, you have this kind of chaos um, of the the forest and then within the chaos you have the sort of treasure chest where you right. fi- you find these sort of amazing polaroids in the center and then you kind of exit through chaos and then go back to the main sequence of the book okay um so that was a kind of the reason yeah it's, it out like yeah that. no it's really nice actually it's good to see i love I think what I like about this series is I actually try and not really look at the books beforehand too much because I like it. It feels nice to go through something really slowly. Yeah. <clears throat> that you haven't seen before. Yeah, that's nice. Um, yeah, so I think it, it's... Um, and just so nice to sort of get, yeah, have complete sort of explanations on how. Yeah, I mean, no one, I guess, works. would... Hopefully there's a feeling or there's a... If you sit with a book, you you would be removed from that um, edit or that yeah. kind of sequence. 
I mean, that's that's the job it's definitely going to do is it's going to kind of stop people in their tracks. I mean, you were going through and then you stopped. Mm. You're like, what's that? <laughs> yeah, why? So, and paper as well. I think that's yeah. the biggest thing. Do you find that when you're putting books together, it, is paper useful in that subtle yeah. pausing rather yeah. than actually leaving yeah. that space? It does make you stop. And whenever I've used something that is of such a contrast to the main stock, it, people are always... I mean, you flick a book and you end up on a sheet that is doesn't sit in that, you know, the, the signature yeah. of the sections. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when you tip in, you, just in terms of the engineering, when you flick, you're going to stop. Yeah. But also, like you say, like when someone comes across something that does feel different, they're going to think, oh, why is that? Why is that different? It kind of tweaks a bit of kind of curiosity. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's a good tool to use. This is beautiful. It's amazing, isn't it? Is this just like a mirror in water or something? Yeah, like? this is a lake that is kind of, it's kind of toxic, it's cyanide, um, that had for some reason ended up in this body of water um, and then the mirror is wow. placed in. Cousins. And so what's your, so, and then with, so with putting books together, how do you go into sort of the, the bare bones of the book? Is it? what's the what's the, the decisions on paper are you using similar stuff to what you've used in other books are you trying to experiment with different stuff what is there a is there a kind of a go-to um that you think with something that's in this kind of format there's not a go-to i mean in terms of like a semi-coated paper that prints well that isn't going to cost a fortune is always like something that you're trying to find the next mm. <laughs> like version of um but i guess also that links into the printing as well right the if, printing if you're going to go digital or if you're going to go off yeah, yeah 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 so that would be like that's your number one sort of fork in the road right how many are you making um is it going to be litho what's the you know what are you going to sell the book for i think that's the question that people obviously sometimes have in the wrong order okay because you, I don't think you want to engineer a book, realize it's going to cost a certain amount, and then later on say, "Well, now I need to sell it for X amount." I think you need to, or have to go back and re-engineer it to re-engineer to, to it fit to, to, to fit costing, to something that right. is realistic. Yeah. Um, I think you should be asking, you know, who are you working with, what's the kind of the appetite or the demand for that book within that market? What is the kind of what should the price be? Mm. Um, and then you've got at least like a starting point to make some of those decisions about paper, extent, cover type. Mm. But that's something that I've kind of realised recently is the, the economics of publishing and how important that is to try and get right. But it's also like the hardest part because ultimately the economics don't really, <laughs> or don't often work unless you're selling a lot a lot of books yeah it's like you're sort of starting off from the back foot a lot of the time um yeah i mean you know it's a business you're the the idea is to not make a i mean you make books because you love them but you ideally you want to sell them you know you want yeah you want stuff to be bought that's the whole sort of thing yeah. so these so so many important factors as a publisher but most of us don't start like that because we're no, passionate and we're passionate. and we're we just so it becomes a learning process into getting massively. into that and it's a steep learning curve um and I, like i mean i just closed the shop and so and all of those kind of realizing the i don't know the the necessity of like approaching it as a business mm. will mean that you're able to continue to make books. It's not that any of us are in this because we want to get rich, but you need to kind of be mindful of the fact that those numbers need to add up. Um, and you need to kind of have a good understanding of them. Unless it's like, it's a, it's a one-off project and you just, you just want to put this book out, yeah. then fine. But if you want to put a book out and then put another one out, and then put another one out, then those things have to all sort of... They have to align, otherwise yeah. you're just stopped at the first... Run moment, out of money. Basically, yeah. yeah. And so what's your process then in terms of when either you approach someone or someone approaches you? Are you saying, 
Um, do you jump? Is the after sort of going through the project? Is it, once you sort of see it's something that you want to work with, is costing right at the forefront of that to begin with? Are you, is the are, are mm. you are you spending the money? Is the photographer spending the money? How is that sort of divided, or is that different between every? Project? It's never the first. It's never in the first conversation. Okay. Well, sometimes it is. If if, if I don't know if it, it, it's at the forefront of people's minds, I guess, because mm. people know that making a book is expensive. Yeah. So if someone's to approach someone else and say, "Do you want to make a book?" Then I guess a, a, a quite. A, question that is going to come up quickly is say is how or who's going to pay for it yeah and now that's something that I'm realizing you need to kind of have a plan for even though it seems quite late after 10 books Mm. but I've worked in all sorts of different ways yeah and we're still trying to find the way that's fair sustainable maybe those are the two things Mm. fair and sustainable I mean like Ideally, you want to make money, but just sustaining, really, I mean, for me, this is a side project. I'm not like a full-time publisher. So being able to cover my expenses, that's sort of become the primary, um, I don't know, motive. But being fair on an artist who has spent years making that work Mm. um, is going to invest a lot of their time um, in the process. And so we've kind of tried different ways. We've tried, started off with a sort of 50-50. We share the cost of printing and then we share the profits. Okay. But I realized that sharing the profits when there's so much lifting to do after you you release Mm -hmm. a book isn't sustainable. No. Because you've got to store it. You've got to fulfill them. You've got to market it. Mm. You've got to do all these like ongoing tasks that really need to be done otherwise the book's not gonna be sold Mm. so doing all of that and then half the money continuing to kind of leave yeah doesn't doesn't add up um so what are your thoughts on the process of like i guess if you were to say completely fund the book you're the publisher you pay for everything the artist gets a, a, a percentage of those copies to take and do whatever with Mm -hmm. once you once you sort of get into the if you're going into that mindset then you're kind of the books that you're that you've got to publish you've kind of got to know that they're gonna be exactly a money maker exactly in a sense and then does that affect and then that hundred percent that affects you percent yeah that's the thing like if you want to be a publisher who just runs with anything that they find intriguing then a 50 50 split is gonna or even i mean there's models from bigger publishers who just want a photographer to come with the money to print. Or they expect the photographer to raise the money to print through Mm -hmm. some other platform. Pre-sales or Kickstarter. Yeah, exactly. Or there's, I mean, I guess the question just needs to be like, is there funding? Mm -hmm. Because funding can exist. And I think it's probably under sort of use in terms of like finding grants, finding support, finding those sorts of ways of, um, Having more sponsors, I guess, is is now done more often. Mm. If it's a project that you feel you can like have a sponsor involved in, um, but ultimately you need to, yeah, like yeah. To your point, if you're gonna like front the whole print cost as a publisher, you need to have a good idea that it's gonna it's gonna sell. Mm. It's and a what, big it's a big risk. What are the important aspects for the artists themselves in the sense that if they've done the Kickstarter, if they've done the pre-orders, they've raised all the money, what what are the benefits with going with a publisher rather than self-publishing? That's a good question. I mean, I've never worked in that way. Okay. Um, but the benefit is reach, prestige, and it is all of those things that I was saying kind of I wasn't valuing in terms of infrastructure, mm. storage, you know, logistics yeah. is a massive part of publishing. If, say, in that scenario, you're probably printing a thousand books, what are you going to do with them? Um, who's posting Who's posting them? Yeah. You know, I've been in the position where you, you 
you dread someone ordering a book because you don't you don't want to queue up again at the post office. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so you need systems in place. Yeah, to make um, it as easy as yeah. easy as possible. And uh, in that scenario, the those systems are completely taken out of your hands because the publisher is looking after them, even though you've um, you've contributed the the money for it, for the books to be printed. Mm. Um, so you worked with so this was we just got this back sequence here a uh, bit of the text and uh, information on the on the publisher and the printing so you work with Taylor Brothers down in Bristol are they mm -hmm. someone that you work with regularly are they sort of they bec it's becoming um, it's becoming more common that we print in the UK um, why is that Brexit <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about Brexit uh, yeah that's good, not... good thing um no, but it is it is kind of because the the benefits of printing in Europe are less the gaps being closed basically by price increases um, by the bringing bringing in it's still it's still aff affordable to print places like Lithuania or Poland yeah, well or whatever, this is the or... thing I mean it depends I think every book you make a decision and like I was saying you're you've made all these decisions about price and economics mm. and, and one of those decisions might be and also the level that you you need to hit in terms of execution um the collaboration the the sign-off process mm -hmm. um so you you are kind of getting closer to where you need to kind of be making that book how you need to be making that book based on those answers mm. i mean if a photographer is going to go on press then it might mean that one of those options isn't um, viable. Viable, yeah. Um, if you want to have a really kind of close relationship with a printer and you want to kind of be experimental in terms of materials or t like sections and signatures and, and throw outs and, you know, if, if you want to have quite a good conversation with printers, some of those options might not be viable. Mm -hmm. um, Printing out in other countries. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess guess a lot of it, the success comes from communication, good communication, and, and sometimes that doesn't help. I mean, a lot of people print in Turkey. Um, they have amazing printers, and there's printers there who have really developed a good sort of support structure for people mm. that might want to go and, like, stay, might want to be on press, might want to just jump on a Zoom call and have a conversation about how it's going. Yeah. Um, but that's not kind of available everywhere. Um, and and in other places, basically, if you print in the best places in Europe, you might not be saving as, as much as you would have done previously. Okay. Um, there's places that you can print, but is it right for the book? Yeah. Can you guarantee that, like, everything is going to go smoothly? Um and no saving is worth like books arriving and being wrong. No, because then you got to <laughs> ship them all back. Yeah. Yeah, I was talking to, because I just went to, um, I was, I thought we've spoken to a few people that have, um, in this series that have been printing more of their books in the UK. We've got um, uh, Goma in Wales. Yeah, the last Stern book before and... this, oh, uh, was at Goma. Okay. Um, and, and then that, Taylor Brothers in Bristol. And Taylor, yeah, Bros. And we just went. Uh, I just went and met with Calverts yesterday, okay. which is based on yeah, Hackney yeah, yeah. Road. And I was like, they've been there a long time. They? They've been, yeah, they're yeah. a co-op, so they've been going since like the seventies. Yeah. Um, and they have a great ethos. They're probably a bit more higher cost of mm -hmm. the market, but obviously they're based basically in central, well, East yeah, London. You can walk there. You yeah. can walk there. <laughs> and so I really love that. I think also it's 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 really important to support. UK printers as well. I used to yeah. I used someone called Blackmore as well, which I really like that did like Chris Killips newspaper sit like the oh, yeah, yeah. these ones was done nice. you know in the UK and yeah. stuff like that. And I think obviously with yeah, with things like shipping costs and all that sort of stuff and if you want to get fly, you know, fly Import out to be on press yeah. and all that sort of stuff, you know, plays in hugely into the factor of what the final costing hundred percent and is. and just kind of like you say, that how how it feels as a process. If it's, I mean, Taylor Brothers in Bristol, and my mum lives in town, so mm. I can easily go there and and then go down, and it's around the corner from the Martin Power Foundation, so I can yeah. catch up with those guys, and they can go on press, and you can do that once, twice, however many times you want. 
Did you and Laura go on press for this? And Laura's away, so it was, okay. uh, I went and just saw like enough of the kind of okay. sheets coming out to sort of sign it off. And what's it like for you when you get to the, what's it, what's the feeling when you're finally, you get the books with you and you've got to be like, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I want the handover. The handover. What's I mean, all of it's of... terrifying. Yeah. The being on press is, is scary because at every one of these ste steps, you're kind of like, you're waiting for something to not be quite right. It's kind of the mindset you need to be in. Mm. Um, I remember being designer sent on press, like when I was working in a studio and just nodding to everything <laughs> <laughs> and thinking, I was thinking, why am I here? The printer was thinking, why is he here? He was showing me stuff and I was like, yeah, cool, see you later. And you realize if you do that and you miss things, then, you know, that is your opportunity to, mm. to catch things that might not be quite right. And that opportunity isn't going to come again. So yeah. you need to know why you're there and know what you're looking for mm -hmm. um, and you can take other people with you you know um bread and butter work on a lot of the color work with us and louis or tom will do a lot of the printing um for the, like the special editions or the or the kind of match proofs or things like that um and so if you're not sure take someone that does understand the process of mm. arriving at the right color or the right kind of yeah. Result so that you can have a conversation with that kind of person on how it can be changed or what's the what's the you know I mean if you notice a spelling mistake it's different but yeah. if you're if you're just seeing like oh I'm not I don't know why but that just doesn't feel like it's landing mm -hmm. and then someone can make a suggestion for how you can tweak it. And is that something you've just learned through doing? It wasn't really, was that was it wasn't really covered when you were studying but I mean you did photography when you were. Uh, that sort of. Yeah, not really studied. I guess I le no, I learned to at a agency. Yeah, okay. Um, but like I say, it's not really. I I don't have the understanding of. I understand print, but I don't understand what is kind of really possible on press without someone who, you know, works in like color day to day to yeah, be like, yeah, okay, yeah. let's look at. I mean, the. It's so kind of technical now in terms of you're not just dialing up and down four colors you can sort of you can do a lot to affect the result on press mm. where before those kind of options weren't really there um so yeah it's a powerful part of the process yeah basically so if you do that in a place where you're unable to physically be present you're mm -hmm. taking again taking a risk and there's a lot of stuff you do always going to be offset or is it um do you do digital printing as well? Or how does it work, especially with like, so what was the run of this? Uh, 500. 500. Yeah. So is that something that if you're hitting the sort of 500 mark, you're like, definitely this is going to be yeah. offset? Even 350, 400. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, depending uh, on the format. Okay. And and then up up to that, you just go digital mm -hmm. just to help with that. Sort of yeah. Constant. I mean, but yeah. Yeah. And and digital's, you know, you get really good results with it as well. Mm. I mean, I really like the zines that we make and the sort of soft cover, looser format, um, lower print run. Probably have been some of the most enjoyable books that I've worked on. I mean, like yeah, Chris I love Mann's that book. Series, yeah. Um, yeah, Chris Chris's book is. I don't know if I've got a copy of it here, but. Uh, um. Uh, um because they come with less pressure. Yeah. Um, you're making a hundred, so well actually we did print all of them again. Oh um, because it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you'd be fucked if if that happened. Like base essentially because of a decision we made to print the images in like a single colour black. Mm. Which you should never have done. Because they just didn't have enough weight. No. But especially because he was going from hand you know, dark yeah. prints that he really wanted that to sort of be replicated yeah. in the printing. But the printer suggested it and we went right, with okay. their yeah, um, yeah. recommendation. And but at, they weren't and, good enough. And that was a run of 150 or something? Or 100, 100. 100. 100. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in general, that that kind of gives you freedom. You're free of kind of the financial stress. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, there's still obviously a cost involved, but yeah, yeah. you know, it's, you're talking much kind of lower figures. Um, and you're kind of more free to explore material and paper without worrying about how it kind of is gonna mathematically be arranged in a book okay. that's kind of section bound. Yeah. If we're talking zine format, you know, you can basically put, you could have the entire thing in different papers if you wanted to, mm. which is fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love and that. And you can mix printing thing. methods. You can like, you know, you don't have to bind it if you don't want to. You can staple it, sew it. You know, yeah, elastic bands. Elastic bands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's sort of. I think for me, what I've basically realised is these can't come as often as they were coming, and I think maybe they should only happen when you really kind of feel it's merited mm -hmm. and and or there's like enough of a sort of demand and desire to kind of make a book of that um, format. And then in between, you can use kind of zine formats just to sort of scratch an itch, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You can, you can experiment. You can... No, definitely. I think that's, you, it doesn't have to always be, yeah, not, not banger after banger, but it's so nice to have that from a publisher when you get those little sort of tactile yeah. things that sort of fill in the gaps between those. Yeah, exactly what you're saying, between those sort of bigger yeah. things. And you guys do like postcards. You've got mm -hmm. like everything on the, do you do like prints on the shop as well? Yeah. Um, I guess just to sort of a couple last questions, but what was it? You, so you had your studio in um, Hackney Downs yeah. and then you were like, oh, I've kind of got this, space it's kind of like a shop but i've got my studio in it and then you're yeah. like i'm going to sort of develop this into studio slash bookshop yeah for guest what was what was it like starting a bookshop uh yeah. it was fun yeah it was great actually <clears throat> i love the process of of the whole thing becoming but it a was bookseller, like becoming a front facing becoming i mean i guess wearing a lot of hats and that's one of the like realizations before I decided to like shut it up for now was that I was wearing t too many hats and had like, I think it was that I was doing it whilst running a design studio almost full time. Yeah. And then you are becoming um, a curator, a, a bookseller, a publisher. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the list goes on the list goes on and yeah. all of those things because it's hard to make ends meet when you open a bookshop mm. is all of those things need to, to be done i mean you know everything you do here is like you need lots of kind of revenue streams to support the fact that books aren't gonna sell yeah as your main you know product yeah they are your main product but you need to think, well, what's actually going to, you know, make ends meet at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. Is it coffee? Is it is it alcohol? That's the um, thing, like, when you open that space, you know, you're going, the, yeah, you're the social media guy, you're yeah. cleaning up you're at the end of the day, you're I'm ordering the social the media beers. guy. If you're not that guy, no one's going to come, so no, nothing else matters. Yeah. And you've got to flog it. Yeah. If you, if you want people to come, uh, as you know, You've got to like push that hard to like get people to your event so that all of those things that you've spent time and energy and money doing mm -hmm. are, you know, have an audience. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've really got to shout about it. And I think that's, you know, also down to the artists themselves, they have to be as equally as shouting about it. I think you can <laughs> yeah. never just sort of say, like, okay, go to the event at this place tell people about it it's just you know I mean that's kind of I tried that and sometimes yeah. it works and it's enough but sometimes but you realize yeah that's isn't enough yeah there has to be an equal power on trying to get people yeah. down you can't yeah you can never re rely on the kudos or whatever of a yeah. space to sort of no yeah and I found that hard and I found like I would even because we one of the ways that we kind of would have a kind of roster an ongoing kind of list of events at the shop was to hire it out. So it obviously wasn't always content that related to guests. Yeah. As a publisher, it w it might be someone that's hiring the space. And that's good because it brings in a bit of money for that week. You can sell drinks. Um, 
you can sell other books maybe and you're taking a commission on the books that you are selling mm. um but even when it's not your own i don't know how you find this situation but even when it's nothing to do with you creatively in terms of the book or the, the kind of the content of that night you still very emotionally involved oh yeah definitely yeah, and the success of that event you still you still feel very much a part of so if for whatever reason someone drops the ball or isn't marketed or people don't turn up that's kind of it's quite a stressful situation to be in yeah 100 percent. and the person who has hired the space is disappointed you're sharing their disappointment you, you, you kind of feel guilt you feel like <laughs> yeah no it's really uh, and then you're like fucking hell like why yeah um so yeah it's tricky but at the same time it's amazing to have a space and i guess realize the value that people place in that being physical places where, where you can go, yeah, you can have a community, you can chat about stuff, you can just common ground. And, you know, it's a shame because we are another one that has closed, but there may be another one in the future. Um, but it was nice and for that kind of short amount of time just to realise that kind of how many people you meet yeah. when you have those kind of bricks and mortar spaces, because um, there isn't enough of them really. Mm. And then I guess there's a final question. What would be your advice to anyone looking to set up their own publishing company? Uh, publishing company. Um, I think just it's hard because we all do it in the same way. I think we all do it out of a place of like, like we're saying passion. You, you really, we're all kind of creatively driven, but this, I mean, I set up a design studio and I approached it in this in exactly the same way, which essentially was not as if it wasn't a business. Okay. And I quickly found out running a design studio that I needed to be better at. I mean, it is a business, so like there's no, but I think when you work in the creative services or the creative industry, there's this kind of shame or, or attached to the, the monetary side of it. Yeah. Um, you almost don't want to talk about it. You don't want to admit that that kind of is a part of what we do. Um, but it's essential, obviously. Yeah, I think also if you sort of come from those roots of a semi kind of DIY yeah, culture. Yeah, 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 that's it. The money that's, is that's, the last yeah. thing that you want to. Yeah. And you just think like, I think when you can do, when you do everything on a hair string for so long. Hair string, is that the right time of phrase? Shoe string. <laughs> when you do everything on shoe string for so long. It's um, you kind of get it into your thing that I can just be like, yeah, I don't, we just we can make this happen. We we could do, it. but then it just can't. Things just can't survive, and that's the thing yeah. that I have to I learn every single day, especially with a place like this. Yeah, is if we want to keep this going, there's you you can be the nicest person to be like, yeah, come on, yeah, let's just let's just do some stuff. But you've yeah. gotta you've gotta hit some sort of target, otherwise yeah. it's just not gonna. Yeah. But I don't want that to be my only tip. So. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think the other one would be kind of deciding why why you're doing it and and who you are as a publisher that kind of makes you stand out or kind of adds, you know, what is distinctive about your, I guess, positioning as a publisher and why you bring in those books out. Mm -hmm. And I think that will stand you in good stead in terms of the like how how people receive you it's the same I guess that I mean it's it's like starting any new company where you sort of but I think particularly in the world of books because um you know they are a resource heavy thing to make and I think we all need to kind of think about why we're making them before we do make books um so I think understanding what your sort of what your desire is, why it's going to make a difference to the world, um, will really help you to decide whether that book should be made. Is it going to make a difference? Are people going to kind of be moved by it? Mm -hmm. And then, make, hopefully, all of those things about money will kind of just work out because there was a 
genuine reasons for it to be made in the first place. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's good. Yeah, it's a good... It's Yeah, you've got to believe in what you're doing. and you yeah, That's really, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess that's it. Believe in, in what you're doing and also, like, why you're doing it and why someone else is going to yeah. be excited by it or believe in it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And then crack on. <laughs> See how you get on. <laughs> I think that's great advice. <laughs> Cheers, man. Nice one. Great to have a chat. Um, check out guest editions online. They've got loads of great books for sale. Uh, please support them. It's always great to support publishers, bookshops. Oh, shebang. So, Word up. Go and get Laura's book. Oh, that's sold out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>